version 2 has released to the public test branch, and with it comes a lot of content and quality of life updates. First, we're going to focus on the vehicle aspect of what's been added. The British have received some much needed love, and the vehicle pool has been updated bringing it up to standard. It now feels like a fully fleshed out faction. Firstly, the Warrior has been upgraded and brought up to standard with its most modern variant. It comes with a stabilized turret, 40mm autocannon, and improved armor. The new 40mm autocannon is no joke. It has a high rate of fire and has a decent damage output, but is balanced with very limited ammo. Next up on the list, we have the Scimitar, a light recon vehicle that fills a similar role to the BRDM. It is decently armored, is quite fast, and has the same 30mm cannon that the original Warriors had. Third on the list, the British get their armed transport, the light protected patrol vehicle, which comes in two variants. One with the RWS 50 cal, and one with the open top, armed with two L7A2 762 GPMGs. Lastly, the British finally get their own helicopter, the Puma. This helicopter has the highest capacity out of all helicopters in the game so far, being able to carry 16 people total. The insurgents have received some love, and have new technical models, as well as some new technical variants as well. While the new models look fantastic, I feel like they're too clean looking, especially considering the older models were a bit dirty and rustier. Maybe a different colour variant would be nice too, some black or some red models. In saying that, the new techies handle a bit better, they feel heavier when they turn and aren't as fishtaily. Even though there's 9 variants that come with the new models, only 4 are actually new. First off, we have the Mortar Techie, which has an M1937 82mm mortar in the back. Mobile mortars opens up some interesting capabilities for the insurgent faction, but there was one thing that annoyed me, was that there was about a 45 degree horizontal turn arc. I feel like it should be about 180 degrees, because you're restricted in how you can use this vehicle. We've had the ZU-23 on a vehicle before, the Ural, but now it's also on a Techie. It's pretty cool to see that the insurgents now have a more mobile AA capability. The turn arc isn't too bad either, being 210 degrees. Now for my favourite, the BMP-1 Techie. It's a glass cannon type vehicle, being very lightly armoured, but it has a BMP-1 turret on the back of it. It can turn a full 360 degrees, and you can utilise the WASD keys to orientate the turret. Expect the Techie to rock around a bit when you do fire though. Finally, we have the M2A1 Techie. It's nothing amazing, but it's an extra variant that provides some heavy support if needed. New weapons have been added, first we're going to look at their in-law, the new hat for the British faction. It's an interesting addition, as it is the first fire and forget style AT launcher to be added. It costs 50 ammo to rearm the rocket. You can still dump fire the in-law, you just point and shoot as usual. Now the in-law, it isn't heat seek based. It uses a prediction system based on user input. So you track the vehicle, it'll beep saying that it's tracking, and then when you shoot, Based on your velocity and your tracking, we'll try to predict where the vehicle will be. It takes some getting used to, but it's a cool feature. The Russians have an updated hat kit now too, utilizing the RPG-28. It's a little more expensive in rearm compared to the in-law, costing 80 ammo points to rearm the rocket. The RPG-28 shoots a bit flatter compared to the old RPG-7. And with the optic, it's not too difficult to be able to hit shots further out up to around a thousand meters. The Mosin has been added to squad with two different models. First we have the M1891, which comes in the carbine or the full length and utilizes iron sights. The Mosins do 75 damage to the torso, so it's not a complete one hit kill. I feel like the damage output should be higher, maybe around the 85-90 mark, as it is limited capacity and is a bolt action. There's two types of reload animations, one utilizing the stripper clip when fully exhausted, and single round reload animations. Next up, we have the M1895 with the PU scope, which is the marksman and sniper variant. I'm usually against sniper kits being added to the game, but the insurgent unit makeup isn't the same as a conventional force, so it makes sense in this case. The PU scope is 3.5 times magnification, and a nice little attention to detail, stripper clips aren't used for the sniper variant, as the optic is in the way. The RPD LMG has been added to the insurgent faction, which is pretty cool to see, 
It's a very old weapon that has seen a lot of use within the insurgencies and still is used to this day. It utilizes a 100 round drum and is belt fed. The weapon is surprisingly controllable while ADSing and is also pretty controllable while point firing. And when utilizing the bipod, as expected, it's a laser. British finally get the Elkan LDS, which completely replaces the ACOG. It has 4 times magnification and offers a significantly better field of view for the optic. The reticle could use some improvement in visibility, but still is nice. The CAF DLC now has a new map, Goose Bay, which to my understanding completely replaces Nanosivik. This map reminds me of a snowy Gorodok, and that isn't a bad thing. It's 4x4 kilometers in size, and to my understanding it is based on a real world location within Canada. The map is sort of flat, it's got some hills to it, but it's not as extreme as Nana Civic or say, Manic 5. Uh, there's a lot of point of interest from frozen lakes to military complexes, you've even got industrial areas and even urban settings. I haven't played the map yet, so I don't know how it will play out, but it looks interesting and I'm keen to give it a go. I have covered the new graphic settings in a previous video, but in this build they're no longer experimental and are a part of the build itself. A lot of new options are available at hand, and with these new settings also come four shadows. In previous builds, turning shadows to low completely removed them, giving you an advantage in certain situations and especially in forests. Within this build, they are forced on even at the lower settings. In terms of performance, I haven't noticed any significant impact. I thought I've been very careful in implementing this, but things might change and people might have performance issues. Streamer settings have been added under interface within options, allowing you to hide a bunch of information to prevent stream sniping and other things. A spawn delay has been added to HABs, so when a HAB is now built or taken down and rebuilt, there will be a 10 second delay timer before a person or people can spawn. The information regarding the timer will be located in the top left where all the fob information is located. If you open your map, the timer is present within the icons on the fobs themselves as well. I haven't played with this much yet, so I'm going to wait till I give my thoughts on it. The first phase to the layer overhaul is in the build. This is mainly the foundation work and initial optimization for the system. Within phase 1, we finally get individual map loading screens, which is awesome to see. A big thing coming is the voting system, which will allow us to not only vote for the map and layer, but factions as well. The system was buggy and slightly broken in this build, so I couldn't get to the faction voting. One of my favourite additions is the additional information on the server selection screen. We now get to see the factions, how long the match has been in progress for, and soon what division or sub-factions are being played. Yes, there will be support for that in the future. The last thing I came across is, is vehicle spawn information. Now if you click the button that displays the vehicle pull perfection on that layer, it will display the spawn time and if vehicles are ready and spawned or not. This is a nice quality of life improvement and it's nice to no longer have to manually time. A refund system has been added for supplies, so now if you swap out a kit or dig down a deployable at a fob, you will get an 80% refund on the supplies used which is quite nice. The first phase to improving the flight model has come, but unfortunately there was a major bug affecting helicopter handling. All I can say is, it was noticeable with the new changes, helicopters feel a bit more weighty and responsive, and weren't seesawing as much. On the admin side of things, a lot of things have changed with console commands, such as role availability, deployables, and even setting next map and layer. In the patch notes it says there were new tools available for managing and keeping an eye on team killers or problem players. I didn't come across anything in game, so I'm either blind or I just missed something, but I have a suspicion it's to do with Archon and other external tools. So my overall thoughts is, this is a pretty good patch, there's a lot of much needed content and game changes that are coming with it. I'm a little disappointed that Dead Dead hasn't uh, made its way to the game yet and it's been delayed, but I still look forward to it. I'm also slightly disappointed that the Humvees aren't in this build at the moment, same with the Hell Cannon. I understand the Hell Cannon has been delayed due to needing more refinement. The Humvees, I'm not too sure why they were removed from the test build. I think they're probably just getting updated and will get re-added again shortly. Anyway, that's it for this video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this and I'll catch you guys in the next one.